My name is Damien Murphy, Professor of Sound and Music Computing at the University of York. Um, and I'm also director of a project called Exile Stories Creative Industries R&D Partnership. And my talk is about digital creativity and the future of storytelling. And it's an opportunity to reflect on some of the work that I've done at the university in collaboration with many colleagues around creativity, digital creativity, and that's led to the, the XR Stories project and how this is uh, changing or shifting um, some of the research that we do and the culture of research um, at our institution and um, with for our colleagues, we hope. So um, just over six years ago, maybe five, six years ago, um, the University of York launched a new strategy and that's for research and that strategy was focused on seven themes of activity, multidisciplinary activity under which our work could become focused and one of those um, uh, themes was creativity and I was lucky and privileged enough to be the research theme champion for creativity and it was a huge opportunity to work with many brilliant colleagues over the last uh, five years and um, I've just stepped down from that role and there's a new cohort of research champions who are taking over from now and so it is an excellent opportunity to reflect back on what this theme has meant and what maybe has changed as a consequence of our work and endeavours over the last five years. And so when we set out to sort of explore the themes, creativity at York emerged from 50 years, we're still quite a new university of interdisciplinary collaboration. And we recognize that creativity is a key driver of modern dynamic societies. And it's at the center of all aspects of our research excellence at the university. Certainly it was a theme that I felt all colleagues could, could be part of because fundamentally research, teaching, learning is a creative endeavor. In particular, our research work consist considered the nature of creativity, the creative process, um, across linguistic and cultural, aesthetic and cognitive dimensions. But in particular, we were starting to realize back then that there was a particular emphasis or interest in research at the convergence of technology, digital games, interactive media, and how we could work with leading partners, in individuals, creatives, organizations in the creative economy to try and deliver new experiences that would provoke, inform and entertain for the wider benefit of our society. And again, this work was based on perhaps 30 years of activity in my own discipline, which is sound and music computing and music technology. And this was based on a collaboration between our music department and our engineering department, based on a common language and a common interest in research practice, collaboration between the two disciplines and how computers ultimately and engineering methods could be used to meet the needs of composers over many aspects of that 30 year period. And so that project music technology is one of the key areas that has sort of emerged from, from York over that particular period of time. Uh, and indeed it's helped, it's, it's, it's given me um, my position at the university over that period of time as well. And perhaps more, more recently that's been made manifest in a, a fairly new department, although it's 10 years old now, Department of Theatre, Film, Television and Interactive Media, which you can see on the right hand side there. And indeed, that's a fundamentally multidisciplinary department that's founded on creatives, scholars, researchers working across theatre, film and television, production and post-production and interactive media, effectively uh, computer science. And so it's a fundamentally multidisciplinary department that brings together arts and humanities research practice, collaborating with computer science and engineering to understand and inform new forms of creative research. And so I just want to talk about some of the particular interesting projects that um, I've emerged over the last few years as part of, of the creativity theme to give a, a wider sense of how colleagues and projects have identified with that particular subject area. One of which was um, an example of, of archaeological creativity. And this is a, 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 an 11,000 year old pendant, the earliest known example of Mesolithic art in Britain that was uh, found at a site not too far from the University of York on the Yorkshire coast or near the Yorkshire coast called Star Car. And colleagues in archaeology um, worked to um, interpret and explore and examine this beautiful piece of work, which you can see here on the screen. Um, and it has these very, very fine indentations and engravings. Um, and they use 360 degree lighting techniques and computer visualizations in order to explore, visualize, render and make you know, realistic what this piece of, of art looks like and, and particularly from the point of view of being able to talk about it and write about it um, in their publications and so um, there's a really interesting publication there for, in the Journal of Inter International Internet Archaeology um, where that piece of work is particularly explored and you can see some of the methods that they use to render 
the, 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 the pendant beyond just traditional 2D imaging and 2D representation to explore and give us the reader a sense of, of what it looks like and what it means and the importance of this artifact for um, our um, uh, archaeological understanding of our country. And if we move from the Department of Archaeology to the Department of History um, and the Center for the Study of Christianity and Culture, um, this small research um, uh, center uses computer visualizations, animation, film to reveal the architecture, culture and history of the cathedrals, churches and the heritage sites around the UK. And that's about interpretation and it's about communication and understanding, but it's also about what the methods and techniques used in deploying those visualizations ultimately reveal for the, the core researchers working in the history and the architecture and the archeology span of these sites, what they reveal about those sites, which is new and couldn't have been explored through um, uh, without using these methods as part of, of their practice. And colleagues in archaeology are also using computer visualizations. And this is an, a, a project called the Four Mountains Test. And this is a, a means of simple and non-invasive um, detection of early onset Alzheimer's. And it's based on sets of landscape visualizations that focuses on, as you can see in this slide here, an arrangement of four mountains. And the test consists of giving the, the subject a, a set of four images in series where three of those images are the same mountain range but rendered using different lighting conditions to reflect different time of day, different seasons of the year, different viewer perspectives on that particular scene and one and the fourth picture then is a slightly different change version of it but ultimately it's not the same landscape and this helps to give a, a, an early potential detection of Alzheimer's because the, the, the way that Alzheimer's affects the hippocampus affects our spatial perception of the world around us and makes that task of identifying four similar but three the same one different images all the more challenging. Um, and so it's a, it's a really interesting project and that is relates to you know, how imaging can be used for diagnostic testing in disease and uh, could potentially transform um, early diagnosis options for what is a terrible disease. And you can find out more about the project at the, the link there on the Four Mountains test. But we also work with our city and we work with cultural organisations and we work with artists and the York Curious project was a collaboration between History of Art um, and many of the cultural centres in York um, to explore the city through contemporary art installations. And the idea here was to move away from the traditional iconic aspects of heritage that exists in our city, to think about its past and the environment in different ways through colour, texture and word. And we work with, again, colleagues in history, archaeology, history of art, to explore aspects of the city in different ways and to, and to build hidden aspects of contemporary art in the city for, for the um, visitors to explore in a, a different way. And one of the other big projects at the university is something called Digital Creativity Lab, which in itself is a team of multidisciplinary researchers working in many different aspects of digital media and storytelling. And in this particular project, which we call Viking VR, they worked with Yorkshire Museums Trust as part of a big exhibition that in itself was a partnership with the British Museum that explored and displayed contents from um, a number of Viking hordes um, uh, as, as part of a major touring exhibition. And there was a particular challenge set to the colleagues in DC Labs, Digital Creativity Labs, as to how um, these artifacts, these aspects in the collection could be translated into experiences and to be and to use virtual reality to render those experiences for visitors as part of the uh, as part of the, uh, the exhibition and so the project brought together again archaeologists animators sound designers user experience researchers scholars of literature to help bring to life the scenes related to these collections and the great viking army when they were camped at Torxey in Lincolnshire, Lincolnshire around 872 AD and so it was a, a huge and significant and difficult project to try and manage um, and tell the story of these pieces in a way that was going to be meaningful and deliver effective and learning you know, experiences that could work for you know hundreds of people through the exhibition a day and, and some of the challenges around that is how you deliver a virtual reality experience that's going to work in a museum context and so that enabled us to build these beautiful beautiful masks that you see on the right hand side of the screen which have a VR headset embedded with them uh, within them and how they could be could be used day in and day out 
and how they could then translate into new novel experiences that could be shared by all the visitors to the museum and, and give them shared experiences as part of that. So part of the research was also in the user experience for this project because virtual reality, if you strap yourself in a VR headset, can be quite an isolating experience. We wanted to make it a more shared experience so that families could explore it together. So that was a very interesting and rewarding project to work on. And so perhaps what's emerged out of some of these you know, wonderful projects that um, I've had experience of working with colleagues on over the, the last sort of five years is they do all feature digital aspects as part of the core work. And so that led then more recently to work on what would digital creativity look like at York uh, and what might it look like in our future? So we worked on consulting widely across our whole sort of community of, of researchers, scholars, professionals at the university to understand what part it plays in their work. And with a view to looking to our future and our aim there now is to build a community of interdisciplinary researchers actively researching creativity in all its forms that's embracing and supported by core technology digital te te tools and methods that both inform and influence new research as well as enhance existing research output so it's about core research but also supporting existing research and to enable collaborative research both with and for the creative industries the cultural sector and other relevant external partners where there are shared economic cultural and societal goals for the widest benefit and public good because many of the projects that i've cited so far are all about collaboration and working with external partners and so the basis of this strategy then was to was four principles that we would like to work on in the future the, the key importance of interdisciplinarity in our work which was one of the original sort of um, aims of, of the original research themes we want to invest in skills, training and support services to enable that change for as wide a part of the community as possible. We feel it's important to have a place within the community, a place where um, colleagues can come together and share their experiences and work on things together and articulate new questions of research around these experiences. But of course, there's also challenges around what we mean by a place within the university now. And we've all been learning to work in different ways over the last 12 months because of COVID. And of particular relevance to that as well is partnership as part of that partnership outside of our university and other universities and how the work that we do can be um, part of the community renewal we would like to see post COVID. So that gives a sense of, of where we've come from and some of the work that's ongoing at our institution around creativity and how that's informed then our strategy for di digital creativity and maybe we'll come back to some of these points for the future as part of the q a but i want to talk a little bit now in the last sort of five minutes or so of the presentation about a particular project that's emerged out of this time which is the xr stories project um, and this is one particular project that has a significant focus on digital creativity and the future of storytelling it's one of nine significant large investments or projects around the UK from AHRC to support and develop work for the creative industries working with universities. It has a focus on what's called clusters of activity. That's a cluster in terms of the creative sector within which you're working and the region in which that creative sector is particularly active. And the map on the right hand side of the screen shows um, the, the one, two, three, four, five, six, eight projects. And then there's what's also called the policy and evidence center, which sits underneath all of the, the regional projects to try and draw together some of the evidence that we're gathering about how R&D in universities helps and supports the creative industries. And XR Stories is focused on Yorkshire and Humber uh, and their Screen Industries Cluster, which is a significant um, area and region of activity supporting the film, television and games industries across uh, a diverse region of the country that we identify as Yorkshire, but actually consists of many different counties and regions. And at the heart of this activity, at the heart of the Screen Industries Cluster in Yorkshire and Humber are two organisations, Screen Yorkshire, that supports investment and production in film and TV in the region, um, supported in turn by the British Film Institute. And indeed, the XR Stories project is a partnership between the University of York, Screen Yorkshire and the BFI. And you see there some of the, the brilliant content that has emerged recently from Yorkshire and Humber production companies and locations in both film and television. And then also associated with the activities of Screen Yorkshire and the British Film Institute is one of the largest games networks outside of London and the South East called Game Republic. And again, there's a huge community of small to medium to large companies working in the games industry um, around various sort of cities and regions of uh, Yorkshire and Humber. And 
XR Stories focuses all this activity to try and establish the Yorkshire and Humber Screen Industries Cluster as the UK centre of excellence in immersive and interactive digital storytelling, no less than the future of storytelling. And storytelling is at the heart of everything that we try and do as part of the XR Stories project. So what does the future of storytelling look like? Well, from my perspective, I can go back to sort of, you know, my sort of idea of what the future of storytelling was like when I was growing up. And for me, it was books like um, the Choose Your Own Adventure series, um, which then led on to the Fighting Fantasy series of books. And ultimately, these are you know books where you're able to, to some degree, choose your path through uh, some form of branching narrative, uh, giving you, the reader, some kind of agency in the story to hopefully succeed in solving a series of problems and get the best outcome. Of course, I was never quite satisfied with that, and I would always be reading those books with a finger in each page, I think, that was trying to look at the best possible option to get me through to the end of the story. And of course, Nowadays, that's, that, that kind of branching narrative-based storytelling has been, you know, supported and replaced by technology. So for XR Stories, the project of, and the future of storytelling is about research in that particular area and colleagues working in industry in that particular area focused on two core areas, which is virtual reality and related technologies and then interactive storytelling. So I've already mentioned some of the work we've done, for instance, with Viking VR in terms of what VR technology might be or what it might offer. In terms of interactive media, that's still quite new outside of the games industry, but probably the most famous example of this in television in recent years was Bandersnatch as part of the Black Mirror series, where you could, again, choose your own adventure or choose your own path through the story by making decisions at particular points. And we're going, the XR Stories project is fundamentally for our companies in the region to support them in their work and endeavours in the future of storytelling through the research and development work that we're doing in Yorkshire and Humber universities. So as an example of some projects that we've supported over the last two years, so XR Stories is its midway point, we've been two and a half years in and we've got another two and a half years to go. One project is led by Opera North working with the University of York and they had a production just a year ago actually um, of Benjamin Britten's Turn of the Screw. And they were interested and are fundamentally interested in expanding their audiences to bring in new and younger audiences into this old and traditional form of, of storytelling. And so rather than doing the usual approach for a trailer for their production, which would be a filmed version of the production on stage, they work with a number of companies and our researchers at the University of York to build this beautiful, interactive, immersive 360 degree trailer that allowed you to explore particular scenes from the opera and listen to the performers render that out in lots of different ways. As of January last year, when it went live, it's, it's had nearly 100,000 views. And most interestingly, from those views, 2,000 people or more than 2,000 people have booked tickets. So the trailer in itself is about advertising, but it's also a way of tracking data through to see who watches the trailer and then goes on to buy a ticket. And can we understand the demographic of that audience to understand what the impact of such a shift in how we market ourselves is to the audiences that we get. And so we did some work focus grouping this and of a group of young people, 60% agreed strongly um, that the trailer made them more interested in seeing live opera and, um, and only 4% said that the trailer had not changed their idea of what that art form was about. And for Opera North, it's been hugely important as well. They've seen it as a completely new way to think about reaching new audiences. It's led to a shift in their marketing outlook um, and, and to involve participatory techniques again to reach out to audiences and that's also resulted in the doubling of their investment in digital engagement particularly post-covid when of course it's so hard for the live performance industry to again make sure they're relevant and reaching audiences and continuing to do their work at a time when audiences are not possible uh, traditional audiences that is the rising tide of the humber is a project between the university of hull and a small company called beta jester and they've worked together to develop an immersive vr story world to visualize how a historic flood affected the city in the 17th century it's based around the poet andrew marvel who wrote about the event 400 years ago and they've developed a 360 degree vr video as an immersive experience and transports the user back to the time of the flood Beta Gesture developed the model in collaboration with maps, archival evidence, archaeological evidence, and worked with the university's Energy and Environment Institute to understand what the flooding effect would have been at that particular time in history. And the idea, again, is to allow users to experience Hull as it would have been in the 17th century and discover what caused the flood in the eyes and the words of uh, the poet Andrew Marvel. 
And finally, from the XR Stories project, uh, as, a, as a brief sort of introduction to what we're doing, this is a project between, again, our colleagues at DC Labs at the University of York, Bright White, which were a York-based interactive media company, and the Science and Media Museum in Bradford. And it's about, it's called Responsive Interpretive Storytelling, and it's using a combination of vision, sound, AI, holographic display, to deliver the right story about particular artifacts to the right audiences at the right time. And in particular here, the object is the BBC Marconi AXBT microphone, which probably has a limited audience of interest in its own right. But of course, when one learns about the role that that artifact has played over the life and development of the BBC's broadcast to the, to the country and to the world, the stories it has literally heard, suddenly it becomes a very, very interesting artifact in, aside from its, in terms of its uh, abilities as a microphone. And from that then uh, a whole possible world of stories and interpretation become possible and the audiences for those stories. And the final thing that I want to mention is um, a project that emerged a little bit out of the, the, the creativity theme from colleagues at our library and IT services at the University of York, which is called Digital Creativity Week. And this was about engaging with students across our organization to um, engage with the potential for what digital creative tools mean for them, and also engaging with the collections in our library and archives, and also with the city. And so over the course of a week, a whole um, cross-section cohort of students come together, learn about coding, learn about digital editing, image editing, sound editing, and the tools to author digital media content. And by the end of the week, they need to have found something to, that engages them, that relates to the city and relates to our collections. And they have to put on a series of art installations by the end of the week, which is then open to the wider members of the university community. It's a wonderful, wonderful project. Um, it's, it's been a very satisfying thing for me to be personally involved with and to see some of the work that's emerged from that. And everybody's had a lot of fun along the way. So uh, thank you very much for listening. That gives a sense and a flavour of some of the work that we're doing at the University of York and have done and what XR stories might mean in terms of the future of storytelling. And very happy now to have to um, listen to questions and have a bit of a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. That was that was really fascinating and, and just some really lovely examples of projects bringing digital creativity into practice. Um, there's some questions starting to come through now. If anybody has any questions, if you could um, note them in the in the Q and A function, um, I'll, I'll kick off with a question if if I might. Um, so, how might we grow um, a wider pool of of digital creatives who who are able to embrace some of these opportunities? Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a really good and interesting question. It's something that we've reflected on a, a lot, so, certainly because uh, we felt as part of doing. The digital creativity strategy work there was a sense of if you're inside the, the the wall as it were and you understand the the tools the technology and the language around um sort of this idea of media convergence then then it, that can be quite alienating to those who don't necessarily sort of understand it as their the, the core work and so i think um collaboration and that interdisciplinarity part that I mentioned a number of times is, is core to that, particularly around research and developing a common language and a common understanding of, of what might be possible. And then the other part of that, I think, which has particularly come out through the um, aspects of the, uh, the Digital Creativity Week and also from our strategy work is developing skills around that, particularly, you know, coding skills as well is, and, and how um, understanding the digital language of code can ultimately transform what you're able to do and the questions that you might ask because there's an additional depth and layer to the understanding behind the questions that open up new worlds and new questions new avenues avenues of research ultimately um, there's a question come through about digital poverty um, are there any issues around that here and, and can we ensure that we're not disenfranchising some audiences yeah, yeah, clearly that's a, a huge issue. And I think it's a huge issue um, that we've had to deal with in, in many aspects of our lives over the last you know, 12 months in particular. It's an issue that we've had to think about in terms of all aspects of our teaching and learning at the university uh, and universities across, across the country and wider. Um, and it's not something that we should shy away from, but I guess at the other side of that in terms of it's looking at how we can support, particularly at our institutions, those individuals who don't have access to such um, you know, tools, technologies, a place to do this. And again, that came through, I guess, in, in some of our, our work. Um, and what we didn't want to do is to create another sort of silo of, 
of activity that again is separating out um, those who are not able to access for whatever reason um, what might be again a, a, a really open door for their future potential um, and so for us again it was really core to work and engage with particularly our libraries and archives and IT services as being the central place that people can access to enable them to um, again find what's right for them and to, to you know to, to get the support they need to be able to um, do this kind of work and that might be as simple as booking a laptop out of the day it might be learning how to code it might be um you know accessing our network as best they can to enable them to do the, the basic work they need to do so it's not going to go away but at the same time i think clearly um it, it's it's a huge issue that we need to get better at because we are changed by the last 12 months in terms of how we engage and work digitally with one another thank you um, thinking about some of the tools that you've mentioned, are there any issues with long-term preservation? Yeah, tools? yeah, absolutely. You know, um, that that's one of the a particular challenge. Really, is um, uh, you know, as as so much of this is embedded in, you know, the, the tech sector and 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 the provision of tools and technologies and software to enable this work to happen, and that then is subject to the the whim of of the market and whether a company is successful or not long term. So there's huge issues about. Um, how one preserves and archives both the content and then develops skills and tools and technologies that are translatable across different media, different um, platforms, different software. And so, again, I guess that's part of what we're in trying to encourage in terms of digital skills is that we're not teaching people to use particular things. We want them to have a common language understanding and ability so that those skills become translatable and future-proof them slightly. Um, so yeah, and, and there's also big questions in terms of how we then preserve an archive, particularly all these new experiences that are being developed for very bespoke and not very common sort of virtual reality and similar platforms um, and how then we you know think about keeping them for future generations and translate them into the, the next sort of media platforms that come along. Lots of issues around that certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Kevin Grist that sparked echo. Um, are the immersive storytelling where community groups and non-technical experts have had a major input? And the question really is how accessible uh, might this become in the future? Um, yeah, uh, let's see if I can think of a particular example. Um, uh, I suppose at the moment in, in the projects that we're working on in relation to dealing with community, you know, we're sort of working with community groups to understand their stories and using, you know, those who are expert in the media to translate those stories into experiences. Um, again, there are issues about how that technology that then translates into those communities. And so we get back to sort of, you know, an issue, an access issue and how we enable others to explore that. But I think it's also about translating the skills down to the individuals in the community so that they can, um, don't need gatekeepers to the, the platforms and the technologies to tell their own stories. I think that's that's really, really important. And um, uh, that will only, um, uh, you know, develop as, as, as the technology and the, me you know, it's still a very new medium. It's interesting that, um, for instance, there aren't many examples of interactive film and television. The Bandersnatch one was a great big sort of high platform, high profile experiment, but it hasn't necessarily spawned lots of copycats. Um, and so there's still lots of risk associated with these new media platforms and these new storytelling experiences and what they might be. So there's a long way to go yet, I think, before they become commonplace. And so there's roles for us in the privileged positions in our you know, institutions to bring as many people along with that story and to tell their stories as we can. And there's a question about COVID and how, how do you think the, the cultural sector could benefit from some of these um, initiatives and, and tools you've described to help with their recovery and perhaps find new audiences? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a, a huge question um, and a really important one, I think. You know, I guess from two of the XR Stories projects, I can, I can cite examples of the Turn of the Screw Opera North project happened just before uh, lockdown last year. But clearly what they learned from developing a new form of interactive trailer in terms of engaging your audiences has informed then how they approach their digital strategy as an organization post COVID. 
the example from the Science and Media Museum has had to shift considerably because that was designed to be a live exhibition that was going to go up last year. And of course, that hasn't happened. So there's, it's still unclear as to how th that project will actually um, roll out uh, and become something and meaningful, whether it will change to be a digital and online experience only. Another really interesting and a quite high profile example of this that was in the news recently is the work of the Royal Shakespeare Company. And there's another big parallel set of projects to the AHRC Creative Clusters um, projects called the Audience of the Futures projects, which are industry led projects that are exploring, again, immersive and interactive storytelling. And um, the, uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company were, have been leading on digital engagement with Shakespeare content um, and using digital platforms. And clearly, and they had a plan to deliver something around, I think it was a Midsummer Night's Dream last year, but of course that all had to change. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but they've taken the learning that they were doing in the development of the digital aspects of that work and that performance to be an online only experience, which is going live in, in March. And there was a lot of press done about it last week. Uh, and it's very high profile, very important events to go and get your tickets and go and explore what A Midsummer Night's Dream might be digitally and online. So, yeah, I think it's hugely important. Um, of course, again, we still want to go back to live shared experiences, but new experiences are coming out of this and it will change how these organisations work and hopefully protect them somewhat against similar challenges um, in the future. Thank you. There's quite a few questions that are coming in about in relating to the, the pandemic. So how, how have you considered how to support digital creatives in the wake of the, of, of the pandemic? What, what additional support they might need? Yeah, that's an interesting one um, and a big question. Um, I don't, you know, I think the work that we've done in XR Stories has been, okay, so the, an example here is, is the work that we've done in XR Stories and most of the companies that we've been working with um, so far are technology focused, um, probably from more of the games industry than film and TV. And, and, that's and they've been able to adapt quite well to the, the, the restrictions of, of lockdown and, and home working in, in a way that film and TV production and again, has been written about quite a lot in the press in terms of film and TV production has, has found more challenging. Um, and also the nature of the, the content that they produce means that there's, you know, there's a digitally online audience that they can market to and, and sell to that's already there. Um, but we're concerned that, it, again, it comes back to questions of sort of, you know, um, digital poverty and, and the common language and understanding of what the potential is for this medium, I suppose. Um, there is a, you know, it's been harder to engage more traditional film and TV production companies in the opportunity that such digital media and virtual reality and interactive storytelling means for them. And part of that is just the traditional production process and that comes from a commission for a particular program or series of programs and the very tight schedule that then is used to deliver that and to, and to produce it for a, a particular platform or medium. And, um, so we've, we've, in the next coming year, we're specifically addressing that by setting up a challenge that's going to be led by a particularly sort of, you know, forward thinking media production company to directly challenge the film and TV production companies to think about something different. Um, here's some funding. Here's an opportunity to work with us and to work with our ideas. You've got great storytelling um, chops, as it were, great storytelling ideas, great writers, great production teams. How would you respond to this challenge, which could potentially become a much bigger commission? And so that's so that's a, a sort of an example of, again, trying to encourage creatives to think new ways about what the medium means that then potentially leads them to new audiences and new ways of working. Um, I guess that might not address the issue which might where the question might have emerged about individual creatives rather than large companies. Mm -hmm. And I think there, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I guess... I think from my own experience, it's, it's about building, you know, building online communities of engagement and, and, you know, this is an amazing opportunity, this platform here, there's a hundred participants I can see. And if we'd done this in real life in a room somewhere in, in the UK, it would maybe be 10, 20, 30, 40 participants who travel to be able to go to it. So there's, a, there's the, you know, things like Zoom, although far from satisfactory, enable us to reach out to communities in a way that we haven't really had to think about before. 
Um, and I think, again, that will, that will encourage and enable those communities to grow and to support one another. And we're not just going to go back to the old ways. We'll have to use some hybrid blended model in the future that brings the best of both, I would hope. Thank you. And um, this question about impact and have you done any work to capture the impact of these um, digital storytelling approaches? Yeah, we, we, we have done some. Um, so a couple of examples there, uh, the Viking VR project. So part of that was we did a big audience engagement piece to explore people's perceptions of the experiences, to explore whether people had engaged with virtual reality technology at all, whether this is, the, you know, because it was you know primarily aimed at families. Um, and so this was from, I think, we saw about 60,000 people go through the exhibition. I can't quite remember the numbers, but for the majority of people who had the experience, it was their first time of doing anything in VR. And therefore we could get some really valuable feedback on what that experience was like for them and whether they'd return to something like this. And also, it, um, although I didn't mention it then, it then did inform the next exhibition that was going into the museum, Yorkshire Museum, and that had a VR aspect as well, because clearly it worked really well at engaging families and, and particular audiences. And then the other thing, of course, is the, um, is the turn of the screw trailer, which we did do some data gathering around, um, and particularly, you know, their work, you know, they were quite sort of clever about it and said it's not just a novel means of engagement let's see how many people buy tickets on the back of watching this trailer and will that inform what we do in the future and that's a really good example of that and on the XR Stories projects it's probably a little bit too early to tell now most of the first set of projects are just finishing so we're doing the work now to go back to them and do the evaluation and monitoring work that we need to do to understand what the impact has been from those projects both for the communities they've worked with uh, for the organizations for the businesses and for the academics that, that have been involved with them as well. Okay um, lots of questions coming in now um, so there's one from an artist who's uh, creating a uh, a geolocated audio installation with interactive sculptures mm -hmm. and what, what would be your tips in terms of um, where to go for inspiration for projects and ideas? Uh, go and look at Echoes XYZ I think it's called which is a company that does geolocated audio tours they're brilliant and they you know they can help you turn um, uh, audio content into something that will be interactive geolocated that anybody can use on their phone great great idea great project top Thank tip. You. <laughs> um, there's a question about addressing the balance um, where there's a, a feeling or perhaps a, a misconception that digital creativity isn't very academic. Um, mm. How might we address that perception? Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, uh, I, I would, you know, I, I, I think that the, the it is very. It, it, the, I think there's a there's a barrier of perception there in terms of what it means, and possibly a barrier of you know not feeling comfortable in a domain you're not familiar with, and a, a bit, being a bit fearful of what you might learn about yourself and and the outcomes of working in that new area. Um, you know, I, I can give an example from my own practice, which I haven't sort of mentioned previously, which is a, a project with a colleague in the Department of History, and he and the work that we did um, around. Uh, um, uh, St Stephen's Chapel, which is part of the Palace of Westminster, which was the original seat of the House of Commons, which burned down around 1840. And we worked on a pro he worked on a project that was looking at the history and the archaeology and the architecture of that space over a, a considerable number of period of years. And as part of that process, some beautiful 3D models were generated by our colleagues at the Centre for Study of Christianity and Culture. But from that, we were able to ask questions about the nature of how parliamentarians sat and engaged in that historic House of Commons chamber. And from that, then we started to realise there were questions about um, how women engaged with political debate at that time when they were otherwise excluded from particularly the public gallery in the House of Commons. And there was a, a study or project that emerged from that about called Listening to the Commons, which is all about um, particularly how women used to gather in the ventilator space around, um, uh, uh, again, um, a, a, and listened in to debate and what their experience of listening to those debates were. And so my colleague John is a historian, Tudor historian, and suddenly he's working in areas of visualisation, oralisation, sound, acoustics that he never would have thought of before. And suddenly I'm also, as someone who's working, you know, an expert in sound, I'm working in the politics of women engaging with, you know, um, the, the, the political debate at that time and aspects of and, in, and, and women's suffrage and the last hundred years of, you know, of, of women in politics in the UK. And all of this went into the Voice and Vote exhibition in Parliament uh, a couple of years ago, which was a, a tremendous privilege, again, to work as part of. So 
but there was you know that that relationship that research relationship between myself and my colleague John and the colleagues who worked on that project was all about communication understanding shifting perspectives and a, a lot of talking before we could understand what we could each bring to something new so fundamentally it comes back to the idea of collaboration interdisciplinarity and communication and to establishing a common ground and from that then new and really exciting opportunities can grow thank you um, a question about libraries and, and what libraries might do to transform their offer um, in, in support of digital creativity you talked a little bit there about about the uh, the York example and and the great digital um, creativity, creativity week. Right. Which, yeah. yeah. Is there anything else you think we can do? Well, I think one of the, the one of the one of the interesting things that came out of our digital creative strategy work was where would we want this work to sort of who would we want to own it and and um, if we want to really you know again, I might hate to use the term, develop some kind of levelling up agenda for our institution to, to bring as many colleagues along as possible with the opportunity that we see a, a sort of a certain number of colleagues have benefited from so far. And so we felt that the library was actually key to that. And, and, and key to the strategy was to, to put in place a project manager and a project manager who would be responsible for building the links between these different communities, both within and out with the university and also um, a, a research technician or a research engineer who had expertise and a background in the social sciences and the arts and humanities, but had the technology and digital skills to be able to translate the ideas that colleagues might come from those disciplines into something where they could, again, interface with aspects of the collections or the archives or the technology to help those ideas along and to encourage those colleagues to sort of benefit from those findings as well. And so for us, it was, you know, it was central that, um, the, well, the library is a central part of our university, a core pillar of what we offer. And to put those individuals in the library means they become for the whole community. So it was fundamental, and it is fundamental to our thinking around um, how we, uh, you know, have a shift at our own in our own home, as it were. Thank you. How can we ensure that storytelling stays at the heart of the work of this work that engenders engagement rather than a focus on on doing cool things with tech? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, you know, storytelling is is a, is at the heart of everything, really. And you know. Um, I've told a story about the work we're doing about storytelling. Ultimately, there are many more different stories to be told about that work. And, and as human beings, telling stories is, is, is fundamental to what we do and to how we communicate, make sense of the world, explore the world and communicate the world to, you know, um, the people around us. So I don't think that that's ever going to go away. And again, it, maybe it, it, it relates back to one of the other examples I gave of how we engage with film and TV production companies to take on sort of or explore what this technology means for them and fundamentally it's not even the film and tv production companies we need to gauge with it's the writers the writers are at the heart of the whole process and the writers who are you know come up with the story ideas and articulate those stories and see them through to whatever final platform they're delivered on be that a book or be that a film or a vr experience they're key to the whole process and so by again informing, I guess, we're thinking the production companies, they can then inform the writers and the writers can see the opportunities of this medium. But without the writers, it's just a bunch of technology. Um, the stories mm -hmm. are at the heart of it and, and um, th that will never change. Have you done any work looking at sustainability um, of, of some of these projects or any, any successful strategies to, to, to ensure that projects become more embedded and sustainable? Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. Um, and in particular, um, you know, for, for, for me and for colleagues who've been working on this uh, at the University of York, there's quite a sort of um, a blurry line between our take on digital creativity and research in that area and digital humanities. Um, and in that it's all part of the same piece. And I know that there's certainly a lot of work being done in aspects of digital humanities to think about what the impact is of increasing levels of digital technology and our digital footprint and AI engines and data storage and all that, what all that means in terms of the wider sustainability and impact of our work in the world. So um, it's not something that's a core focus of, for instance, XR Stories at the moment or the work we're doing as part of our strategy work at the university. 
it might come through as particular sub projects as part of that but i know it's certainly a, a significant issue in in the field more generally and more widely and it's one that we certainly need to address thank you and um, this question about promotion of, of these projects um what channels have you used is it primarily social media or, or what other solutions have you tried yeah that's that's another really interesting question um i think um yes yeah, social media of course is really important most of the examples that we've cited so far were ultimately designed to go to a live audience, be that at a festival or be that in an exhibition in a gallery somewhere mm -hmm. or be that on the screen for a shared experience. Um, and so, again, that's that's been a huge had a huge impact on how the projects and the organizations and the companies we work with have responded to that challenge. You know, a big um, platform for the creative clusters projects on behalf of the UK and AHRC and so on was um, the South by Southwest um, festival in Austin in Texas, because that's one of those big festivals where, you know, there is a, a big convergence between technology and storytelling and new experiences. And, and that was a really important shop window effectively for some of the projects that we were developing and, and the companies who had developed them. And again, that, that was, it was this time last year when it was one of the, the first big sort of cultural flags that basically said this is going to be a serious situation that we're dealing with when South by Southwest cancelled around this time last year um, and so that's again had to mean that they had a huge impact on the companies from the UK and from XR stories who were going to go there and so they've had to all shift and pivot onto sort of online means um, so again I think there's there's issues around how we promote this how we make it accessible how we engage with those audiences how we preserve those experiences more generally for future people to explore them and uh, experience them um, and I think a lot of the projects and the companies that we work with at the moment are thinking about that. Thank you. Um, question from an archivist um, uh, commenting that's fascinating possibility is here for exhibitions but then that there can be reluctance amongst some archive towards non-traditional tech solutions um from the archaeology case study or any others is there any guidance on making the case to explore this yeah that, that was again a really good and relevant question the viking vr project was a really good case in point there and that was a huge risk for the yorkshire museum to take on on what was going to be a really high, high profile exhibition for them um and to give a part of that exhibition floor space away to a digital medium that had never been tried in the context of either that kind of exhibition or um, the Yorkshire Museum before. So it was a huge risk, and uh, but it was, it was a risk worth taking. And again, it was down to a long period of collaboration and communication between the Digital Creativity Labs team at the university and the team at the Yorkshire Museum, particularly their digital officer, who again, they, th th that those two, individuals understood what the potential was here and it was a case then of, of really sort of taking a long-term planning view on it and really sort of you know risk checking it at every stage of the process and making sure it was going to work and it was going to deliver and it was going to work day in and day out and it wouldn't stop people going through the exhibition because it was a huge bottleneck for instance and, and the project almost fell down at the very very last minute because the paint on the the masks that we created was not antibacterial and we had to try and source antibacterial paint that was going to be health and safety compliant and put up with 60,000 people over three months going through and handling them. So even the smallest things, it almost all came down at the last minute. Thank you. I'm from a writer, I love the spread of questions here. So a question from a writer, are, are they at a major disadvantage because not many of them have coding skills? That's a really, oh God, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think they are because um, I, I, I would, you know, anyone who, I, I, I wouldn't, at no point would we want to, um, you know, disenfranchise or, or those who, who can't code or, can't, or aren't sort of digital natives or au fait with this technology because um, there's still so much that can be brought to the table in any kind of collaboration or research project. Um, but I think there's, there's other advantages that can be brought if you're able to, at least appreciate and communicate in that kind of side of the language and the technology and what then it offers that's new to your own practice. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that's probably um, the, the best sort of way of thinking about it, really. It's not to replace. 
and it's not to demean anything anything that an individual brings to again a particular collaboration or a project but it's what can be added to your skill set already and your practice and your experience that you would not have been able to have done before that opens up new individuals avenues for you as an individual so i would yeah i, I don't think you're at a, dis, a, a writer is at a disadvantage but to learn and understand for instance what non-linear narrative might be in the con and how that might be realized for different digital platforms would potentially be a really exciting thing to explore. Okay, thank you. One final question. Um, what was Upper North's conversion rate with their traditional style trailers? Oh, that's a, oh, uh, that's, that's a, a data question I don't have, to be fair. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think they tried it before. I don't, I really, I think the nature of this type of trailer was um, to, to explore that opportunity. Whereas previously it was a pretty sort of, traditional example of let's shoot the production on film on stage make a short film of it cut it up for about a minute and make it available so people have got a sense of the excitement it's going to be like don't think they tried it as a, as sort of a specific digital marketing tool before i could be wrong and i'm happy for my colleagues on that project to tell me that i am wrong um, but i think it was quite a new thing for them first chance to try this out